I'm not an integral probabilist, but I'll try to, um, well, I won't be talking about integral probability, but I'll say, uh, talk about this uh, 2D stochastic heat equation. Um, and I'll put a link in the chat to the slides um, on my website that if you'd like to flip back, you can uh, take a look at that. And um, yeah, so this is based on a, a preprint on archive. It's joint work with Yugu, um, who's at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I'll get started. So sort of the central character that I'm going to be talking about today is, is inspired by the stochastic heat equation. Um, so let me just introduce this, if you're not familiar. Um, so this is a parabolic um, stochastic partial differential equation um, where we've got a, uh, um, so we have a time derivative and then on the right-hand side, we have some kind of smoothing a, a diffusion term, um, like a diff heat, heat diffusion. Um, and then it's being forced by a space-time white noise. And it's being forced in this sort of multiplicative way. So we multiply the solution by a, a space-time white noise, and that gives us um, the, the forcing um, on the heat equation. So this is kind of a basic example of a, of a stochastic PDE. Um, it's a simple example of a system exhibiting intermittency. So the, the solutions here will have um, kind of very high peaks. Um, and, and the moments will not be sort of well, the high moments will not be sort of well controlled. Um, it's also um, related to the KPZ equation, which is maybe even sort of more famous, um, just by the Kohlhoff transform. So if you take a log um, of the solution here, if you take log of u um, and, and call that h, then that will satisfy, at least in a formal sense, that'll satisfy the, the KPZ equation. Um, so this KPZ equation here, this H we think of as like the height of some kind of random interface. Um, and it's being subjected to a dynamics that includes some kind of spatial smoothing, um, some kind of nonlinear slope dependent growth, and then some kind of random forcing. So this random forcing here, this is now just an additive forcing. So you could just be you know, dropping sort of blocks randomly onto the surface or something. Um, but then there's gonna be some kind of nonlinear growth. Um, so this is, it could be some kind of stickiness between the, between the blocks. So this KPZ equation, um, you know, people have wanted to study um, for quite a while, um, but this equation is sort of very difficult to study um, because of this, this nonlinearity um, combined with the roughness of the solution. Um, so the, the solution will actually be too rough to make sense of this nonlinearity directly. Um, so one sort of early attempt to understand this KPZ equation was via the stochastic heat equation. Um, so this equation, at least in dimension, in spatial dimension one, um, you can solve this um, sort of using sort of more elementary tools. Um, it's the mild solution theory for, for stochastic PDEs to sort of make sense here. Um, and then you can just take the log and call that a solution to the, to the KPZ equation. Um, other ways of understanding the KPZ equation, there's sort of more, more famous tools. Um, regularity structures of pair controlled distributions let you make sense of this equation sort of directly um, in dimension one. Um, and of course, you know, you can also see it as, you know, limits of varying particle systems. And there's been a tremendous amount of work on this in dimension one. Um, I'm going to be interested in this talk um, in the case of dimension two. Um, and in higher dimensions, um, the, the mild solution theory for the stochastic heat equation, it, it doesn't work. Um, and the reason here is that the, the space-time white noise will be too rough to, to make sense of this product of u times c. Um, so, that basically means that there's going to be some kind of um, you know, divergences when you multiply these these two guys together. That the the higher order Fourier terms are going to sort of um, be too big for the thing to even make sense as a function. Um, and then it turns out you can't you can't multiply two distributions by each other. Um, and sort of moreover, these sort of fancy tools that that helped us out in dimension one. Um, for the KBZ equation, they actually don't apply in, in higher dimensions um, this, the, because the solution sort of won't, isn't locally expected to look like the white noise. Um, so these, these tools that have been introduced for the, for the KBZ equation in higher dimensions don't work. So um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do in two dimensions? Um, you know, we'd certainly might be interested in um, you know, height fluctuations of random services or you know, diffusion of, of heat with some kind of random forcing in higher dimensions. So, so what can we do? Um, and sort of, well, this is not really the solution, but it's sort of how you would set it up is, well, we, we can't understand the, the singular problem directly. 
Um, so let's mollify the problem and consider a smoothed, a smoothed noise. Um, and so we'll just convolve the noise with some kind of space, some kind of spatial mollifier, which I'll just take to be a Gaussian of, of our standard deviation epsilon. Um, and then we want to take a limit as epsilon goes to zero. So we say if, as the correlation length of the noise goes to zero, um, how, what, what do we get? Um, and it turns out you, you don't get anything. Um, but what you should do is if you modify the equation, so if you divide the noise strength by square root of log epsilon, then you get interesting limits. Um, so you actually have to consider a sort of very weak noise problem um, to get anything non-trivial. Otherwise, sort of the reason it's ill-posed with a space-time white noise is that you can't take a limit as, as epsilon goes to zero. Um, but if you if you attenuate the noise so it's weaker, um, then you can you can get a get a result. Um, so let me state it this way, and this is due to Caravena, Sun, and Zigurus in uh, 2017. So we need to be working, so we need to divide the, the noise strength by this, this square root of log epsilon, and then we also need the constant in front to be below a critical threshold. So there's a critical threshold at, at beta equals square root of 2 pi here, um, and this factor in front of the, in front of the noise. Um, but what they proved is that for fixed, um, for, at a fixed time and a fixed spatial point, so we just look at the one point statistics here, um, we have a convergence in, in law of the solution um, to this explicit random variable. So this random variable right here, this is a log normal random variable. Um, and the variance is, is known explicitly in terms of beta. Um, so notice that this, this variance blows up at, uh, at beta squared of 2 pi. So there's some kind of critical um, threshold at, at beta equals squared of 2 pi. At beta equals squared of 2, two pi, there's, there's other work um, that has sort of looked at, looked at that case. Um, and so I put some references here, but, but I, won't, I won't talk about the critical case more, but, but sort of something different is supposed to happen. There. It, and there, the limit should not have function value solutions, but you should be able to get a limit as a distribution. Okay, so let me say a little bit about how, how um, this problem has been understood in the past, um, so how this result was proved. Um, and this is maybe sort of another motivation to study the, the stochastic heat equation. So there's an explicit, so the stochastic heat equation is a linear, Linear problem in initial condition. It's a, I mean, it's a parabolic PDE. Um, so there's a Feynman Katz formula for the solution. Um, so, so we can actually have an explicit formula for the solution um, in terms of in terms of a uh, so a Brownian motion. So we'll introduce a Brownian motion here, which is completely separate from the noise, independent of the noise. Um, so this is a different sort of randomness. And then for the Brownian motion, we will think about um, running the Brownian motion backward in time. So we started it at time t in position x, and we run it backward in time. And we integrate the value of the noise along the path of the Brownian motion. And then we multiply by the noise strength here. And then we take the exponential. And this is a, a normalization factor. So this thing has, has expectation of 1. Um, and this is the partition function for directed polymer models. So the directed polymer model um, would be we weight the probability of the Brownian path by this sort of energy here. We say that we, we like a path sort of proportional um, to, to the amount of noise that it picks up to the integral of the noise along its path. And then we'll sort of tilt our, our probability measure um, of, the, of the path um, to favor places where the noise is bigger um, as opposed to just the, the normal Brownian path. Um, and this here we take expectation over all you know, over the space of all Brownian motion. So this is then the partition function for that for that directed polymer model. So if you're interested in random walk in a random environment or Brownian motion in a random environment, then, then maybe you're interested in the stochastic heat equation. Conversely, if you want to solve the stochastic heat equation, um, you can you can do that in terms of um, these Brownian motions. Um, so one sort of fruitful thing to do is you can write this write this exponential in a power series. Um, so you, you just expand the exponential as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus dot dot dot. Um, and you get a chaos series for, for u epsilon. So each power of the exponential um, will sort of correspond, it'll have that power of the noise um, in, the, in the power series expansion. And so that means you actually get a chaos series for, for u epsilon. Each, you, you get, you, in other words, an expression for u epsilon in terms of powers of the noise. Um, you could also try to, to write um, moments of u epsilon as exponential moments of intersection times of Brownian motion. Um, let me caution that because the moments the moments don't tell the whole story because um, remember the statistics here are approaching log normal, which is not characterized by its moments. Um, but, but nonetheless, you can get some information out of, out of this sort of 
grounding intersection times. Um, this, phase, this payment CAC formula is valid for beta bigger than critical threshold, right? Uh, right. So this this Feynman Katz formula is as sort of positive epsilon. This is this is just true. Um, okay, okay. So then everything's sort of well posed, and there's there's no problem. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge is to take limits as epsilon goes to zero. Um, which I'm not telling you how to do right now, um, but but sort of the way that they prove these things is by by looking at this chaos expansion and then sort of understanding it. You know, resumming it in a way that that you can see the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So one more question. So yeah. which initial conditions are we thinking of? Uh, sorry. So, so here, here, this is for initial condition one. Um, so constant initial condition. Um, oh, sorry. This is initial condition A. Sorry. OK. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you, so this formula makes sense. You just put, a, you just put an initial condition evaluated at x of 0 um, right here. So you okay. still have the Cat's formula, but the, but the result is just stuff with constant initial condition. Okay, um, so kind of the goal of our of our um, study here um, that we were interested in is is um, so the Feynman Katz formula is a, is a very special kind of beast. So it only makes sense if, if the PDE is um, linear in, in the initial condition, um, or you can only write it down if you know for, for linear PDEs. Um, and sort of our question was, you know, how can we develop tools that will work in sort of more nonlinear settings um, where we don't have this sort of explicit formula for the solution. Um, so kind of our, our prototypical model of, of such a thing, or not, well, the model that we considered that, that has such a property is this nonlinear um, 2D stochastic heat equation. Um, so this is the same as the, as the linear stochastic heat equation, except that instead of multiplying the noise um, by u epsilon, we're going to multiply the noise by some function of u epsilon. And this, this sigma is going to be a nonlinear function. So it could, be, it could be anything. And again, we'll start at a constant initial condition. Um, but sort of in parallel with the, with the requirement that our beta be less than square root of 2 pi um, that we had before, we're going to impose sort of an analogous condition um, for the, for the nonlinear problem um, that our sigma is Lipschitz and the Lipschitz constant is less than square root of 2 pi. Um, we'll also require that sigma of 0 be 0, um, just also an analogy with a linear problem. That we're sort of, so that the solution will always stay positive. Um, so if we look at this problem, um, we see that there's no Feynman-Katz formula. Um, there's also no chaos series. So if you wanted to try to expand this out in powers of the noise, um, you sort of do the first the first term. You'd say, well, um, maybe it's maybe we just sort of approximate sigma by one. Um, but then the next term, so then you get sort of a, a Gaussian thing. But then the next term, you then plug your plug your noise into the inside of the sigma. Um, so instead of get a, getting a polynomial expression in the noise, um, now you've, if you wanted the polynomial expression, you'd need to sort of expand sigma in a power series, and there's sort of no, no reason you can do that. Um, so, so there's really the, the tools that have been used sort of to study this thing sort of more explicitly are, are really not available. Um, nonetheless, this does generalize the linear case. Um, so this linear case is just sigma of u is beta u, obviously. Um, but let me point out that this is not a perturbation of the linear problem. Um, so sigma, I require that it's not, it's not too big. It's not, it's not too sort of wild. Um, but it's, it's, I don't assume that it's close to linear at all. So there's no sort of perturbative expansion that you'd expect around the linear problem. Um, and in fact, we're not going to get, we're not going to expect log normal limits for this thing. So it, it should have really kind of a different behavior, um, but in some sense, in some sense analogous. Um, so let me let me sort of uh, state our state our theorem. So again, this is a joint work with Yu Gu. Um, so we again consider this nonlinear stochastic heat equation started at a constant initial condition for some positive constant. Um, and again, we look at the at the one point statistics. Um, so a fixed a fixed time point and a fixed spatial point. Um, and then what we get is that the solution of this um, nonlinear stochastic heat equation converges in distribution as epsilon goes to zero. So again, we, we say it converts to something. Um, so before we before um, Caravan, Sun, and Zagura said that it converged to a log normal random variable. Um, and in our case, uh, we don't have, well, it's not, the answer is not so simple. Um, but nonetheless, we can characterize it. So it'll characterize as something called x of 2. So what is x of 2? Well, x of, so x will be a, a, now a, one, a solution to a one-dimensional problem. 
Um, so it'll basically be a solution to a stochastic differential equation. So that stochastic differential equation will be dx is some variance db, so it's a martingale. And then the quadratic variation of the martingale will be given by the expectation of sigma of x of 2 all squared, conditional on x at the current time. So this is a little bit strange. Um, so what I'm saying is that x is a martingale, but in order to in order to know the quadratic variation of the martingale, you have to I, you have to tell me the distribution of x at the final time. Um, so so it's it's not even clear that this is sort of a well posed sort of object um, because because the sort of the variance is sort of part of the ingredients of how we're going to get to the final condition and that hasn't happened yet. So we we don't it's not necessarily clear. Um, that this, this sort of makes sense, but there's, turns out there's some sort of fixed point argument you can do to, to solve this thing. Um, so let me make a couple of comments. I'll, I'll come back to this problem and, and say a bit more about this problem um, on the next slide, but let me make a couple of comments. Um, so we have this time parameter here. So the stochastic key equation is evolving according to some time. Um, and then this X is also, about, is also evolving according to some time, um, but the times are not the same time scales. So the time scale for this stochastic, for this um, one-dimensional um, SDE here is an exponential time scale and it, and it depends on epsilon. So this Q, according to which X is evolving, is related to T by, by T is capital T minus epsilon to the Q. Um, so we sort of fix the final time and then, then most of the time represented by this SDE is spent in a, in a small layer um, right around the final time. Um, and the reason that the final time is two in the Q variables is that when, when Q is two, this little T is capital T minus epsilon squared. And that's sort of the scale at which you start seeing the, the finite correlation length of the, uh, of the, or the non-zero correlation length of the noise. So, so past Q equals two, you're sort of looking at scales that, that the noise is basically constant and then, and then it's sort of, that ends up being sort of negligible. Um, so we're basically sort of going on this exponential scale Heading down to the um, the correlation length of the noise, and then and then past that point, so nothing nothing more helpful. Um, okay, and sort of lest you believe that this problem is just another problem that we don't know how to solve, in the linear case um, where we know that the this x of two is supposed to be log normal, um, this SDE actually becomes explicitly solvable. Um, so there's an explicit formula for the solution. Um, which is just a geometric Brownian motion up per time change. And that, of course, has log normal statistics. So this, this, um, this theorem lets us recover um, the log normal behavior um, that, we, that we know happens in the linear case. Um, but the proof method is completely different. So it actually gives us a new proof of, of the behavior in the linear case. So, um, yeah, so any questions about the, about the statement here um, before I go on? So why does small x appears in the final limit? Ah, so the final limit um, actually does not depend on capital T or on or on little x, right? So this is okay. a this is a one point. So we start at constant initial okay, positions, okay. Um, and so this is a oh, and it's only the one point, one point distributional behavior that we're looking at. So it's independent of, of small x. I see. I see. And um, I'll talk a little bit of, uh, at the end about multi-point statistics. So we can actually understand those as well, but but it's sort of less interesting because it turns out that if if you have two points x and x prime that are macroscopically separated, um, they'll be independent in the limit. So the multi-point statistics only make sense sort of for points that are sort of only microscopically close together. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, do you have any results for other initial conditions or? Um, no. So so what we're, what we're doing is, um, is just for constant initial conditions. Um, I think it's, Conceivable. I, th I think it's pretty plausible that that you would. I mean, you would certainly expect similar behavior. Um, you would probably not expect such explicit a formula. Like even in the linear case, you wouldn't expect an explicit formula necessarily. Um, one interesting case is delta initial conditions. So in the linear case, delta initial conditions is actually like the distributional statistics will be sort of equivalent. But the the, the angle of the of the final the total mass of the final time will be equivalent to the one point statistics with flat initial data um, in the linear case. And that's not so clear in the nonlinear case, um, but, but it's 
plausible that you could be able to do something with with delta initial data looking at the looking at the total mass at, at the final time. Um, but yeah, that's that's a, certainly could be a question for future work. Okay. So let me elaborate a little bit more on, on how we're characterizing this limit here. Um, so, so I I made it sound sort of scary that in order to know the uh, the quadratic variation of this martingale, um, we have to evaluate some functional the expectation of some functional at the final time condition on the current time. Um, so it turns out that this sort of object has a name. So maybe you're familiar, but um, let me just explain a little bit about the about the background here. So this is what's called a forward backward SDE. And you can alternatively write it in as sort of a coupled system of one sort of forward, forward stochastic differential equation and one backward stochastic differential equation. Um, so this dx we can write as, as a um, square root of y db. So y will be the, uh, be the quadratic variation. Um, and then x will have an initial condition. So that means it's a forward SDE. Um, so it's, this is this is just an honest sort of SDE evolving forward in time, um, but then the y will be so y will will satisfy this SDE, where z is something that is not told as part of, part of the problem. So z is a, is actually supposed to be solved as part of the problem. So basically, this equation here means that that y is a martingale, right? So it, it's uh, it's can be written as z db um, for some z, but, but I won't tell you what z is yet. Um, what I will tell you is the final condition for y. So the final condition for y will be given by the final condition for x, um, but with sigma squared applied to it and then divided by this factor. Um, and so if you think about, I have a martingale and I specify the final condition. Um, so then that actually means that y will be the dube martingale um, for that final condition. Um, and so, and that's exactly where, where this, this term comes from. Um, but these forward backward SDEs um, have been sort of studied before um, in, in math finance and uh, filtering theory and other areas. Um, it turns out that, that none of the well posedness theories that we were able to find in the literature anyway actually apply for our, for our particular example. Um, so we actually had to prove, and this is, so this is part, of our, part of our result, that, that this, um, this forward backward SDE um, has a unique solution on the, on the range Q, and zero, Q from zero to two. Um, up to this, so we only prove it's unique, sort of in the class of functions satisfying this this technical condition on which it's constant. Um, but but, uh, but yeah, so so this this um, yeah, so we have this well posedness theory, and sort of the reason that the standard well posedness theory sort of wouldn't be expected to work for our particular problem here is that um, uh, this this two is tight here, so so this. This, in general, this is this um, equation is not well posed um, past past q equals two, um, given our assumptions on sigma. Um, so it's actually well posed up to something like one over four pi minus beta squared. But since beta is restricted to be less than square root of two pi, um, that ends up being q is equal to two. Okay. Um, so that's that's really all I'm going to say about this limiting object. But the point is that there's some lim limiting object that we can understand as, as a solution to some kind of one-dimensional problem. Um, and in principle, you know, there's, there's numerical tools for simulating this thing. So it's it's now we've reduced an infinite-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem, and, and sort of that actually, um, you know, is quite a bit of progress. It seems like because the one-dimensional problem is sort of a pretty concrete thing that it's, you know solution to it basically an SDE. Um, okay, so the rest of the talk um, I will. Uh, focus on kind of what goes into to understanding this thing. Um, how, you know, how do we, how do, how would we, really, I just want to convince you that this, this limiting um, forward backward STE is a plausible um, limiting object for, for the system we have here, sort of how it comes about, but that'll involve sort of sketching most of the proof. Um, so let me sort of uh, tell you how that works. So again, we're, we're only interested in the one point statistics here. So we have one, one fixed time and one fixed spatial point. Um, and so we'll, we'll sort of fix those now once and for all. And the sort of the big challenge we have is to reduce our problem from this infinite dimensional um, stochastic PDE into a one dimensional um, stochastic differential equation. Um, and so the way that we're gonna do that is by um, sort of, we're gonna start by discretizing the time scale and then sort of extracting a, a sequence of one dimensional statistics that actually capture all the information we need um, to see the evolution up to this final time in this particular point. 
So I'm gonna fix these parameters delta and gamma, um, which for now I just think of them as, as small parameters um, and gamma is much smaller than delta. Um, and they, they will depend on epsilon. Um, and, and so here's the precise statement that you need here. Um, and then we're gonna define these two sets of time points. We have TK and TK prime. So TK will be capital T minus epsilon to the delta K and TK prime will be capital T minus epsilon to the delta K plus gamma. Um, so we have, the, these are small positive parameters. So note that TK prime is bigger than, than TK. Um, so it kind of alternates. We have TK, TK prime, TK plus one, TK plus one prime and so on. Um, and sort of our, our first sort of big, first sort of main observation here is that um, we can turn off the noise on these intervals from TK to TK prime. Um, and it won't change the solution at the final space time point in the limit. Um, so why is that? And so by turning off the noise, I just mean replace the noise by zero in the, in the equation. And that means that the equation will just undergo the usual um, deterministic heat equation on the intervals from TK to TK prime. So why is that sort of reasonable to, to, to expect? Um, basically, the reason is that the contributions of the noise to the solution of the system are sort of according to this exponential scale. So the noise on some sort of time interval in the exponent contributes to, to the length of that, ex, of that interval in the exponent of epsilon. Um, and so because um, delta gamma, because gamma is much smaller than delta, um, the times between TK and TK prime are much smaller than the other times. Um, so on an exponential scale, the time that we're cutting out is, uh, is much smaller than the time that we're, we're leaving. So, so most of the noise is actually still contributing. Um, now that requires you to take for granted that, that what I said that the noise sort of contributes according to, to the exponential scale of the time. So on this epsilon to the, to the exponent of the time. So let me give you a little bit of a heuristic for that. So if you look at the linear case and you do the Feynman Katz formula just for the variance, so the variance of the solution, this is the second moment of the solution, I guess. Um, it's given by, um, so the initial condition squared, it's linear in the initial condition. Um, but then it's the integral of, of this Gaussian um, time, of this Gaussian with variance epsilon squared evaluated at a bearing motion integrated from time zero to t. Um, so how does this sort of, how does this thing behave? Um, well, so if we if we restricted the noise to be from TK to TK prime, then we just get a, um, that sort of contribution is coming from going from TK to TK prime in this integral. Um, and if you just computed the expectation, um, you can compute that explicitly. So this this um, this Gaussian um, kernel here is is basically scaling with one over um, sorry. So the sorry, it's the um, the this Gaussian kernel is basically, a, we think it was like a delta function at zero. And then the density of the, of the Brownian motion at, at, um, at zero is gonna be like one over S because we have a two dimensional Brownian motion. And so then we get, um, we, we, we get like a logarithm when we take the, take the integral. Um, and so the, then we get this logarithm and then because we're attenuating by this, this log of epsilon, um, that's why it's an ex epsilon dependent ex exponential scale. So the log epsilons cancel and we just left with the, with the difference um, in the, uh, of the, of the exponents is that contribution from the noise. Um, and so we have one over delta sub intervals and we're cutting out a noise of, on length gamma of each one. So, so we want gamma over delta to be small. And it turns out actually we want gamma over delta squared to be small because this cartoon is, is not that accurate. So when you look at actual second moments instead of first moments, you, you need to take gamma delta squared. Okay, um, but the point is that, that we can cut out the noise on these sort of time intervals, which look small on the exponential scale, and we don't change the limit. Okay, so why would we wanna do that? Um, so the goal is to reduce this sort of infinite dimensional problem to a one dimensional problem. Um, so we've turned off the noise on these, on these time intervals, which are, which are sort of um, short on this exponential scale. Um, so what that means is that time TK prime, so the noise has just been turned off for a while, um, and the length of time that the noise has been turned off for is about epsilon to the delta k. Um, so really it's, it's epsilon to the delta k minus epsilon to the delta k plus gamma, delta k plus gamma, um, but epsilon to the delta k plus gamma is much smaller um, than epsilon to the delta k. Um, so on this, on this time scale where it was turned off, it's just been undergoing the usual heat equation. Um, 
On the other hand, what we have to think about at time tk prime, what values of the solution do we actually care about? Um, to because we're only interested in the solution at the final time t and the final point x. So at time tk prime, which is capital T minus epsilon to the delta k plus gamma, um, we only care about the, the solution here um, for points that are within um, the square root of, of capital T minus tk prime um, of, of x, which is uh, epsilon to the 1 half um, delta k plus gamma. Um, but because we've been undergoing the heat equation um, for time epsilon to the delta k, um, that's going to end up leaving the solution basically constant on scales of size epsilon to the delta k over 2. Because um, that's what the heat equation does. It smooths things out on, on its parabolic scales. Um, and we note that epsilon to the delta k over 2 is much larger than epsilon to the 1 half delta k plus gamma. Um, so even though gamma is small on the exponential scale, epsilon to the gamma is also small. Um, on sort of the real scale. And so, so this, this um, the size that we're actually interested in is much smaller than the size on which we've been undergoing the normal heat equation. And so what that means is that we can replace the solution at each time tk prime by a constant. Um, and so, and that, so we can just take the value at, at x, for example. Um, and because the heat equation has been smoothing out our solution um, for enough time that the solution is now essentially constant on the scales that we're interested in, um, all we need to know about the solution is that one constant at each, at each time tk prime. So we'll just replace it by a new constant and then start over um, and, and run, it for, run it for more time. And then we iterate, right? Because there's t1, t2, t3. So we have all these subamples. So at that point, um, we've replaced the solution by, by this constant at each time tk prime. Um, and so now you start to believe that we can approximate the final solution by a, by a one-dimensional problem. Um, because we've, I've now said everything we need to know about the solution is now just, just given by a number at each time, and we have sort of a se sequence of those numbers. Um, in fact, it's sort of more than just a sequence of numbers. It's a Markov chain, and it's also a martingale. So it's a Markov chain that's sort of, it's sort of clear because we replace the solution by a, by a constant, and then we let it evolve further. Um, so that's, that's going to be Markovian. Um, and it's a martingale. Um, just because the, the solution is preserves the, the stochastic heat equation preserves the expectation uh, if you set the constant initial conditions. Um, so now we have a Markov martingale with sort of smaller and smaller time steps. And, and our remaining goal is to show that, that this, this sort of discrete sort of Markov chain is converging to the solution of an STE as epsilon goes down to zero. Um, and sort of up to some technical things, which, which Struk and Barden sort of worked out um, decades ago. Um, the main step is to compute um, the variance, right? So, so the martingales are basically characterized by their quadratic variation. Um, and so what I need to do is tell you how to compute the quadratic variation, um, you know, normalized according to the, to the step length that was previously given. Okay, so how do we compute this quadratic variation or this diffusivity? So um, now things start to look worse, um, but I'll try to go slowly through this and, and make sense of this. So we want to compute this, this variance of, at each step. Um, and we remember that our solution was given by, uh, so at, at time, um, so time k, at, at time, so the yk is the solution at time tk prime. So it's been undergoing just a normal heat equation for time tk prime minus tk. So we're going to be, we have this heat, this uh, heat kernel here. So I guess maybe I, maybe I didn't say that G is the heat kernel here. Um, the Gaussian with variance, with this variance. Um, so we're going to integrate this heat kernel against, well, so it's going to be the solution of the equation started at time tk minus 1 prime um, run for time tk minus tk minus 1 prime. Um, so, so this is sort of the time where the noise was still turned on. We just have a solution to our original problem. Um, but started now we start with initial condition yk minus 1. So at, at time tk minus 1 prime, we replaced by a constant, which we called yk minus 1. Now we'll run the equation with the noise for time tk minus tk minus 1 prime. Um, and then we will run the equation without the noise for time tk prime minus tk. And that will give us our average solution at time tk minus 1, or at, t, at time tk prime. Um, 
get, and so then you can approximate it here. So I just took out the, you subtract two exponentials, you get the larger one. <clears throat> um, and then now we can apply the mild solution formula for, for u epsilon. Um, so we have this mild solution formula, which is, which is just the Duhamel formula, um, if, you, if you prefer that terminology. Um, but this is just, we sort of, this is the forcing, and then we are just adding up the forcing at every time, um, integrated according to the heat product. Um, so that's just the solution formula for, for parabolic um, PDE. And then you can plug that into this expression we had for the variance here. And, um, and what you get is, is this variance of the stochastic integral here. Um, and, so, and so basically this, this uh, G, G, GT here sort of gets added to this, this, um, this, G, this, this G here. And so you're basically doing the Duhamel formula on sort of a, a longer time interval where there's no forcing um, on, the, on the last little bit. Okay, so this is sort of how we want to compute it. This is sort of our expression for the variance. Um, now, this is this is now just a stochastic integral against um, some noise with um, correlation length epsilon. Um, and sort of the special thing about the stochastic heat equation in two dimensions, which still holds in our setting, is that asymptotically u epsilon is constant on scales of order epsilon. Um, so it's, it varies sort of more slowly um, than order epsilon. And what that means is that, so when we compute this variance, we basically get, um, we're going to get like an integral over um, y and y prime and s and s prime. So we, we double all the variables. Um, but then we only, we only, we require that the doubled variables be sort of close to each other according to the correlation length of the noise. So, so s will have to be equal to s prime because the correlation, because the noise is is white in space, and y will have to be within epsilon of y prime because the correlation length of the noise is, is epsilon. Um, and since u epsilon is asymptotically constant on, on the scales that, uh, that, the, that the noise is, is correlated on, that means that we, when we compute this diffusivity, um, we can actually approximate it by um, the, just the variant, just by the second moment um, of the forcing term. Um, we don't need to consider multi-point statistics of the forcing term because the, the correlation length of the noise is small compared to um, the length on which the, the forcing, or on which the, uh, the noise strength can vary. Um, so what we've done here is we've expressed the, the diffusivity um, of the Markov chain in terms of the expectation of sigma of, um, of u evaluated at, at sort of the, the time interval on which the the equation has to run um, for each uh, you know, for, on, on the length that that, that step of the Markov chain is, is going for. Um, again, okay, okay, so I should point out that the other approximation that I'm making here is that um, here we're actually we're doing a time a time integral as well, um, but the statistics of the of the problem actually don't really depend on time, um, except for a little layer at the beginning. So so if if, if the time is order epsilon to the alpha for some alpha, um, then it will be different, but but it only depends on um, the exponent of epsilon. It only depends on the, the exponent of epsilon um, in the time. Um, and since we're just doing an integral with, according to the Lebesgue measure here, um, the log to the base epsilon of s in this expression is basically constant, except for a little layer at the beginning, which doesn't matter when we take the integral. Um, so, but but again, you know, so the the takeaway point here is that the the diffusivity at, at one step of the Markov chain is given by the expectation of sigma. Of u evaluated at, at epsilon to the delta k um, squared. Um, and we take the expectation. Okay, so how do we get a forward backward SDE um, out of this diffusivity? Well, so now, now things start to come together. Um, so so the, the variance of each step is given by the expectation of sigma of u of, at epsilon to the delta k um, squared. And we note that epsilon to the delta k, so this is. Basically, the amount of time that our, our, um, our u still has to run to get to time capital T. So remember that, that Tk, or Tk prime, is about capital T minus epsilon to the delta k. And so, so this amount of time that, that u still has to run is, is basically the amount of time that, that u still has to run. Um, so, so, so the takeaway message is that to compute the diffusivity of, of the Markov chain, um, we, all we have to do is, is um, start an initial condition, um, which is the current value for Markov chain, run u epsilon to the end, and then apply sigma squared, and then take the expectation. 
So if we want to run u epsilon to the, to the end, since u epsilon is being approximated by the Markov chain, that's the same as running the Markov chain to the end. Um, so now you can write sort of an expression just in terms of the Markov chain, where you can write um, the diffusivity of the Markov chain is approximately, as epsilon goes to zero, it's approximately the expectation of sigma of the Markov chain at the end squared, conditional on the Markov chain being where it's at at the current time. Um, and so if you, if you start with this expression um, and then you, you uh, use some sort of standard tools um, from, from SDE theory, um, this is enough to show that, that in fact, um, this Markov chain converges to the solution to this forward backward SDE. Um, and so really you just have to sort of squint to go from here to here that, that this is your diffusivity here and this looks a lot like this if you think that you know, k epsilon is, is two over delta epsilon. Um, it all kind of works out. Um, as a technical point here, um, we actually, so everything I've said has been in terms of the second moments, so we just compute the diffusivity. In order to actually get the convergence here, um, you need some tightness. So you actually need um, some moment that's higher than two. And for that, we actually use the chaos expansion. Um, so Caravan and Simon Zagurius worked out a, a moment bound for the linear problem using hyperconvectivity on the chaos series. Um, so that's sort of some kind of um, big hammer. And then there's a stochastic comparison principle that says since our, since our problem is, is below um, where the, the variance is, is always bounded above by the, the variance of their, um, of their linear problem, um, we can use the comparison principle to, to show that we have some, some moment that's bigger than two. Um, but that, that's just to show the tightness to, to get the line here. So that's all I want to say about, about the one-point statistics and, and sort of how we get that markup chain. Um, so I have a couple more minutes. So let me, let me talk a bit about multi-point statistics. So everything I've set up to now has just been about looking at one time and one space position and, uh, and what, our, what our solution to the, to the SPDE looks like there. The multi-point statistics, it's actually, well, the result is sort of, there's actually not much to do. Um, so we've already shown that there's a solution to this, this um, forward backward SDE. Um, let me point out that this, this is the diffusivity from the forward backward SDE. Um, this only depends at, on XQ at the current time. Um, so we can actually write this as a, as a deterministic function of, of little Q and X. Um, and then our original, um, forward backward SDE, we can write this as now just a, a regular SDE. Once we've solved for this J, which is, which is this um, diffusivity, um, this X just satisfies, this is just an ordinary SDE. Um, so the solution to X sort of played a role in determining J, but, but ultimately J is just, a, is just a deterministic function. It only depends on the law of X. Um, and so, so this J, we can now think of as just fixed once and for all. Um, and now we can use that. So I won't go through sort of the technical details of, of this theorem, but, but basically um, the, the idea here is that if we look at um, two space-time points um, that are macroscopically separated, um, their solutions to the stochastic heat equation are gonna be independent of those two points. Um, if they're not macroscopically separated, but they're separated by, by some distance, which is like epsilon to the alpha, um, then they basically, they will feel the same noise up until a particular time. And then when there's about epsilon to the alpha over two time left, um, then they will, uh, like on that scale, um, they will be independent past that scale. So, the, so once, so after that, after that time scale, now they'll be feeling sort of independent noises. Um, so if you want to look at multipoint statistics, um, so, so what this, what this DIJ thing means here is that, is that, um, are different, the different T's and X's that we're interested in are separated by, by epsilon to the alpha for some, some alpha between um, zero and one. Um, then to approximate the multipoint statistics here, you run an entire family of SDEs. And basically what you say is that these, you let the SDEs evolve together up until the, up until the, the scale at which um, the, uh, at which the space-time points you're interested in start to seem macroscopically large. At that scale, the SDEs then branches, um, and so they you know they start at the same same point, but then they run independently 
um, in the future. So that's that's why we so they that's what this I sub Q is doing. Um, it's just saying that we, we they use the same grounding motion up until a particular point, and then they branch and become independent um, after that point. Um, but since they're always just being forced by by this is for each the marginals of each one is just the same SDE as for one point statistics. Um, but this is just saying how you couple them. You run the SDEs together, um, and then you let them split off at the appropriate time scale, uh, and then you get sort of multi point statistics um, for the for the final problem. Um, so in the linear case, um, Caravanasan and Zagoras also did the did multi point statistics, and, and our results are all multi point multi point statistics can also be solved explicitly to to recover theirs. Um, let me point out sort of one other problem that that um, we sort of addressed, but we we didn't look at in detail. But you could also think about what what happens if you want to if you want to think about the solution to the stochastic heat equation as a random field. Um, so, in order to do that, you have to subtract the mean. So it, it doesn't make sense as a random field, sort of the way that I've stated it, um, because at two macroscopically separated points, the stochastic heat equation solution are independent. Um, so it'll be sort of a, a completely independent random field, which is not so interesting. Um, to get an interesting um, random field as opposed to one point statistics, you need to subtract the mean, and then you multiply the whole thing by a square root of log epsilon. So you actually blow it up um, and make it bigger. Um, and then in the linear case, you get a you get Edwards Wilkinson behavior. So you, you get a, a Gaussian um, random field. In the nonlinear case, we also expect Edward, Edwards Wilkinson behavior, um, the Gaussian behavior um, for the for the random field as a distribution, um, we show the convergence of the variance to what it should be um, for, for um, but we don't we don't show the the, uh, the convergence um, in distribution for the for the field value solution. So that that's um, probably can be done, um, and it was done in the three dimensional case by by Yugu and Joey Lee. Um, but unlike for the one point statistics, in the, in the nonlinear case, we also expect Gaussian statistics um, when we average over an, over an entire field. Um, the nonlinear, the non Gaussian statistics seem to be limited to the one point statistics um, or, or sort of multiple um, time points. So um, let me just conclude um, with a couple of kind of future directions um, and sort of um, you know, ways that we would like this to, to go potentially. Um, so the KBZ equation um, is related to the, to the stochastic heat equation just by this Kohl-Hopf transform, um, by this logarithmic transformation. Um, but it's it's really a special case of a stochastic Hamilton-Jacobi equation, um, where you, where instead of uh, squared here, you you put a um, some kind of general nonlinearity. Maybe you want it to be convex or or, uh, or something, but, but you know, in principle, it's just general nonlinearity. Um, and so, sort of. Studying this problem um, in, in two dimensions is is also sort of um, challenging because um, again there's no Kohl-Hopf transform, so you, you're not going to be able to relate this to the to the linear stochastic heat equation. Um, unfortunately, with the general H here, it's not related to our nonlinear stochastic heat equation. That's sort of not how the the transformation works. But we would expect a similar structure for this equation. Um, so there's some possibility that that uh, that you would expect the same kind of um, behavior. Um, of, of being able to turn off the noise on these intervals and sort of having a one-dimensional problem in the one that um, we would expect that that's still be true for the, the stochastic Hamilton-Jacobi equation, um, but, but that's still completely open. We, we, have, we don't know how to, how to prove that. Um, another sort of question is, is what happens to the critical case? So I mentioned in the critical case at beta equals square root of 2 pi, um, there's this interesting behavior that's sort of not well understood yet, um, but there's been progress. Um, in the linear case, the nonlinear case, um, that would that would also be interesting to understand. Um, one sort of difficulty would be that it's it's not quite clear what criticality should mean. So so in our setting, subcriticality assumption became an assumption on the Lipschitz constant of this whole function. Um, so if the Lipschitz constant is is you know achieved, you know somewhere, or the you know you get sort of the worst case Lipschitz behavior somewhere. Um, you know is that enough to kick us out of the subcritical regime, or or is that you know does it need to be sort of you know really sort of over a long interval? Um, have the have the critical beta um, be achieved. Um, you know, so that's that's completely not clear, um, but that could also be a topic for future work. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say today. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. All right, thanks, Alex, for the nice talk. Uh, so if anyone has questions, they can unmute themselves.
So I have a question. Like, can you go back to the multipoint theorem yes. slide? Yeah. So can you explain this equation like d b i whatever it, that one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so basically, what this so this if you okay. So first thing is that so okay. So we have a we have a family of Brownian motions b one through through b n. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all burning motions. So if, no matter what this I is, you're always, you're always feeling the effect of some burning motion. Um, yeah. So the, the marginals for, for fixed J, this will always be, be evolving according to, to this equation. Um, what this I sub two minus Q, two minus capital Q over two is doing. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, this capital Q, uh, this should be a lowercase Q. Okay. Sorry. Um, but basically, what this is doing is saying that um, we two point the points two different points they under they feel the same Brownian motion um, up until the time at which the remaining time is like the square root of the distance between them. Um, so sort of the parabolic, like on the parabolic scale, they become macroscopically far apart relative to the amount of time that's left in the evolution. Okay. Um, and then at that point, they will separate. Um, and so this is sort of a formalization of that. So this dij is like, dij means that epsilon, that um, xi and xj are a distance epsilon to the uh, probably one minus dij. Okay. Um, yeah. And then this is, this i, I sub q is just, we just pick the one of lowest index to sort of index the Brownian motion by. Um, and so if, if, there, if dij is, is smaller than q, then i and j will undergo the same Brownian motion. And then when, when q is large enough that, that um, dij is less than, so it's, it's two minus q over two. Um, when it's small enough that, that, uh, that dij is, is uh, is not less than that anymore. So now they're macroscopically far apart relative to the remaining time. Um, then, then they feel different Brownian motions. So they, they two, the two SDEs diverge at that point. I see. Okay. So on a small scale, they have they feel the same Brownian motion, and when they are far apart, they are driven by the different Brownian motion. Yeah. So well, when they, so it's like on the they, so two points that are close together, basically they're feeling the same noise, up okay. until the time such that the remaining time window, such that their distance from each other is large compared to the remaining time window. I see. And then they feel it's kind of what you would expect that you know two points that are if they're close together they feel the same noise. If they're far apart they feel different noises. Um, but this is sort of relative to how much time is is remaining in the problem. Mm. So is there any scale where you have non-trivial correlations? It? No, so it's 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 on this exponential scale. So I the, see. the correlation function is like a function of log base epsilon of the distance between the two points. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so on any particular scale, it'll be it's it's, it's trivial. So you have to look on this epsilon dependent exponential scale. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yep. Yeah. In uh, with this uh, forward backward uh, SD that you have found, mm -hmm. uh, the one with uh, x of two. This one. Yeah. So you said that uh, when uh, sigma is is uh, linear, mm -hmm. then this uh, this has a, a solution. Yeah. Is there any other function sigma such that this uh, this equation is solvable? <laughs> yeah. So I is know of one other one. <laughs> Um, if sigma of x is square root of x, then you can also solve it explicitly. That the is problem is that square root of x is not Lipschitz. So our theorem actually does not apply. But uh, does this mean that uh, 
for example, the stochastic heat equation uh, is solvable with uh, sigma is equal to square root? So it, so it doesn't mean that because our theorem only applies if, if sigma is Lipschitz. And so if, if you have, if you put sigma of x as square root of x, then you can solve the STE, but we don't have a theorem that, that says you have the convergence. Okay, but uh, do you think this is a hint that uh, that yeah. equation yeah. might be exactly solvable, for example, or no? It's, it's, it's possible. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. So, so if sigma of x is square root of x and you don't, then if you don't attenuate by the square root of log epsilon, you, you don't do that. So if you just if you just consider uh -huh. like without this log epsilon here, then the so then it's actually solvable if sigma of x is square root of x, um, and it's it gives you a super Brownian motion. Um, so that doesn't rule out. I mean, you could still have a different solution if if uh, you did attenuate by this log here, um, but but that'd be kind of interesting. So this this fact that you, you said this fact I, I didn't know this fact that. Uh... The two-dimensional uh, stochastic heat equation is solvable with uh, sigma is equal to square root. So this is a well-known. Yeah, part. I believe it's a, I believe it's a super Brownian motion. Ah, I see. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you mean by exactly solvable, but but you know, it is. Uh, you can write, uh, for example, Feynman cuts formula, for example. Yeah, I mean, air modifying the noise as well. So if you, if you if you take epsilon to zero, so if if in the, if sigma of x is square root of x, you can you can just take epsilon to be zero and and you get a measure valued solution. Okay. But that's kind of yeah, that's it's, yeah, it's kind of a different world. Mm. Yeah. So I but I don't know our approximation results. We really use the Lipschitz constant being subcritical. Um, so it'd be very interesting to yeah to see. You know, if you take the square root, it doesn't grow as fast as infinity, but it's it's not Lipschitz at zero. Um, I don't know. It seems, I mean, it seems hard because if you you could, this is sort of you could take the initial condition to be arbitrary, and you'd sort of think that for a very small a, um, then the sort of the, the gradient looks enormous for square root. So it seems like maybe something different is happening there. But yeah, I don't know. Alex, just one question. Um, so maybe the idea sounds very interesting. Have you tried to run it for one dimensional multiplicative stochastic heat equation to recover some type of Tracy Widom? There's all under some double limit. Uh, um, wait, sorry, what was the last thing you said? Well, I mean, like you get KPZ equation, but if you want to get Tracy Widom, you have to take this one, two, three scaling. So maybe you have to take two limits somehow. but. Yeah, I don't know. I think that um, this, like, I think it's not really supposed to be true that that this that in one dimension the solution will just depend on the noise sort of in the layer around around the final time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the scaling is kind of different that we're relying on. You know, this kind of this kind of thing is is not true, um, but I haven't worked it out really carefully. So, so yeah, it's, it's possible. Okay, let's see. So, do you expect this to somehow work better with higher dimension or something? So, with higher dimensions, then you lose. I think for higher dimensions, probably this reduction to a one D problem that may still be possible. Mm -hmm. um, but what doesn't happen in higher dimensions is is this thing here, um, that the u epsilon is asymptotically constant on scales of order epsilon, okay. um, and that's basically because in higher dimensions there's a stationary solution, so you 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 rescale by some, but it's it's the the problem is really just a rescaled version of a of a macroscopic problem. You don't divide by the square root of log. Mm -hmm. um, you get a you get like epsilon to some power, but that's really just a rescaling. Um, and so when you rescale, it's like varying on orders on scales of order epsilon, whereas here it's like constant on scales of order epsilon because of this log that you're dividing by. Um, so I wouldn't expect the forward backward SCE to crop up 
in that setting. So actually, I mean, you, you, Gu, and Joey, we sort of worked out the three-dimensional case. They got the Edwards, Edwards Wilkinson statistics um, and stationary solutions for g greater than or equal to three. Um, but but the one-point statistics um, there doesn't seem to be analog of this thing. But you could you could probably get something, but it'd be like in terms of the stationary solution. Um, I mean, it's really just like the stationary solution has one point statistics, mm -hmm. but, but that's not, I don't think it's really, I mean, even in the linear case, that's not really integrable to know what those one point statistics are. So that's different from the two dimensional case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 